On, on behalf of um, ACDC and the Infectious Disease Control Section of UFA, it's a pleasure to welcome you to this session. Uh, my name is Michael Edelstein. I'm the, the president of the Infectious Disease Control Section. And together with my co-chair, um, Carl Egdal, who's the head of uh, public health capacity at ECDC, it's a pleasure to present you this session on um, health and migration with a specific focus of on infectious diseases. I think I, I don't need to add a lot from this morning about the, the, the importance of the urgency of the issue of migration from the for following the, the presentation from, from Dr. Sophie Bo. Um, but what I will add is that there are there are many factors that drive migration into Europe. There is economic factors, there are people who are displaced by, by conflict. There are increasingly um, climate refugees and, and, and people moving because of, of climate change. And I just want to give a few figures before I, I introduce um, our, our keynote speaker. According to IOM, the International Organization for, for Migration, in 2017, there were 78 million uh, international migrants living in Europe. This is more than 10% of the population. And in 2017 alone, two and a half million people arrived into the European Union. And obviously this has significant implications for public health in Europe. It has implications uh, on, on our healthcare systems, but these individuals are also vulnerable and particularly susceptible to infections. So the questions that we'll try to answer in the next hour or so in this, in this session is really what are the public health implications of uh, migration in Europe at the European level, at the national level, at the local level, and how can Europe um, respond to this challenge both at the policy level and at the operational level. And to, to kick off this discussion, um, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Sally Hargreaves, who will give us um, an overview of um, migration and communicable disease in Europe. Um, Sally is a lecturer uh, in global health at uh, St. George's University in London, and her particular interest is in migrant health and health systems research with a particular focus on tuberculosis and vaccination. So without further ado, Sally, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. There are currently one billion people on the move globally um, these are mostly labour migrants moving within and between low and middle income countries. We've got some of the highest rates of forced displacement on record, 68.5 million people fleeing war and violence, and an unprecedented rise in um, migration to Europe over the last two decades, which is set to continue. Migration is now a global health priority and without question a defining issue of our generation. This is one aspect of migration to Europe at the current time. Since 2015, we've seen some of the highest rates um, of movement of people through Europe since the Second World War. Um, and we now have a situation where we have tens of thousands of people living in transit camps across the region. This is an ongoing health and humanitarian emergency um, that's largely gone out of the media, but certainly hasn't gone away. These add to a diverse mix of migrants, um, including 35 million EU migrants living outside of their country of birth, part of a much bigger, wider group of labor migrants. And we know very little about the health needs and health experiences of these people. Data published this month show that there could be around 4.8 million undocumented migrants who obviously have very few rights in terms of access to health systems. Gaps in national data systems make it very difficult to draw conclusions around the health of these different migrant groups, which is a key area that needs strengthening. And a lot of has been made in recent years of the negative impact of migration on Europe. Um, but there is overwhelming evidence to support positive benefits of migration. We know also that migrants uh, constitute a substantial portion of the healthcare workforce in many European countries. 30% of the doctors in the UK are migrants. Um, and billions in remittances um, are sent back home every year um, to low and middle income countries, an amount more than three times larger than official development assistance. And going forward, we must work harder to highlight some of these positives of migration and to challenge some of the xenophobia that's becoming all too common. 
Mainstream health systems in Europe have reacted to rises in migration by restricting access to migrants. And we now have a situation where we have thousands of migrants in Europe who have access to emergency health care only, are being deterred from seeking health care or charged fees. In a study of migrants presenting to Medicine de Mon clinics across Europe, this is around 43,000 patients, mainly Syrians and Afghans, 55% had no health care coverage. And to date, the global health agenda around universal health coverage and the sustainable development goals hasn't seemed to have applied to migrants living in high-income countries. But this is certainly changing now, and we've seen increased international and regional dialogue around the health of migrants. Following on from the New York Declaration on Refugees and Migrants in 2016, um, we then had two global compacts which called on member states to incorporate the health needs of migrants regardless of legal status into national health policies. Then earlier this year in May, um, WHO member states prioritised a global action plan to promote the mental and physical health of refugees. Um, six priorities are, out, are outlined in this, in this action plan, including the need to accelerate progress towards achieving the Sustainable Development Goals, including universal health coverage. And we need to work to leverage the momentum generated by these commitments to ensure the right to health for migrants in our own countries. So what are the health needs of migrants in Europe? This is a really important study by Rob Aldridge and colleagues at UCL incorporating data from 15 million migrants, which showed that international migrants to high-income countries actually have a mortality advantage when compared to the host population. And this advantage persisted across the majority of ICD-10 categories, suggesting that migration on the whole is healthy and aligning with the fact that often these are young people. Half of all migrants to Europe at the current time are under the age of 28 years. However, this mortality advantage didn't apply to infectious diseases, and we know from a great body of evidence um, being, uh, uh, that's been published by the ECDC and others um, showing that migration is influencing the epidemiology of key infections in Europe. Migrants, as Michael said, comprise around 10% of the population of Europe, but 30% of all TB diagnoses in any given year, and 25% of Hep B and C diagnoses. And this is, of course, linked to not only the higher burden of disease in the countries of origin that they're coming from, but also the barriers to health care that they experience on arrival, their poor socioeconomic status and, and various other factors. TB, for example, we know is declining on the whole in Europe, but it's important to note that it's actually increasing in the migrant population. Uh, the WHO has defined minimum standards of TB care and treatment in migrant population in, in, in Europe, but there remains considerable variation in terms of approach across the region. Around 40% of new cases of HIV each year are in migrants. Historically, this was an imported infection in migrants, but now around 63% of migrants who are estimated to have acquired HIV post-migration to Europe. Um, with data suggesting that they're a group that present late to services, which of course has important implications for how we design and deliver health services to this group. We know migrants too are an under immunized group in Europe. Um, we've shown that migrants as a whole have low immunity coverage, uh, particularly adult migrants and certain nationality groups. We've shown measles, for example, of coverage of around 81%, whereas what we want in migrant populations, and indeed all populations, is um, for coverage to reach herd immunity thresholds to prevent outbreaks and uh, cases of vaccine-preventable diseases. The European uh, Vaccine Plan commits to the elimination of measles and rubella um, and, and calls on member states to pay special attention to migrants, but in terms of impl implementation, we're lagging behind. Few European countries have systems in place to offer catch-up vaccination to, to adult migrants specifically. And interestingly, 10 of 32 European countries surveyed reported that they would actually charge adult migrants on arrival for catch-up vaccination. Encouragingly, there's now renewed focus around strengthening screening programs targeting migrants, going beyond this historic focus of screening for active TB on arrival to incorporate other infections and using on arrival screening as an opportunity to facilitate linkage to mainstream health services for the long term. 
So we need to acknowledge that we won't make regional targets for the elimination of TB, HIV, hepatitis and vaccine preventable diseases if we don't place a renewed focus on migrant populations. And we need to adopt a much more holistic approach to migrant health through mainstream health systems, uh, better considering the unique needs of this group um, who are now residing in Europe. To this end, the ECDC produced public health guidance on screening and vaccination of new migrants to the EU in 2018, which uh, provides some very strong implementation statements. Uh, the ECDC calls on member states to provide free treatment, screening, referral and linkage to care for all individuals who require it, including undocumented migrants, to ensure all screening is voluntary, confidential, non-stigmatizing, and to consider the new, unique needs of newly arrived migrants and take steps to reduce dropouts. It goes beyond TB to allow, uh, outline approaches for a number of key infections and vaccine preventable diseases. And the next step is very much to ensure these guidelines are widely disseminated and promoted. As health professionals and researchers, we now have a vital role in influencing the dialogue around migration and health in Europe. And I want to end by highlighting some of the recommendations made by the UCL Lancet Commission on Migration and Health, which reported in 2018 and whose work is still ongoing. The Commission calls for equitable access to health services and to all determinants of the highest attainable standard of health for migrants, integrating migrants uh, better we know will benefit entire communities, it calls for greater prominence to be given to health in policy making around migration, to ensure adequate monitoring of these UN and WHO initiatives, to improve leadership and of key importance to make migrant communities part of the solution. And I look forward to discussing these and other is issues with the panel for the remainder of this session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sally. Uh, I think this was a very interesting uh, overview and introduction. Uh, also highlighting some of the myths uh, behind uh, immigration, uh, refugees, and, and the dynamics of infectious diseases. Uh, but quite often uh, in these conferences, uh, we have a strict European perspective and seeing this as uh, an issue of what is happening in Europe. But uh, this is really a global issue. Uh, large parts of the migration, large part of the challenges with refugees are not within uh, the borders of Europe. And aligning to the theme of this conference, which is really uh, building bridges and looking at this for a more universal or planetary context. I'm very happy to introduce uh, the first panelist, uh, who is a dear friend and a colleague since many years, uh, working uh, within uh, some training programs. Nada Goshen from uh, Lebanon. Uh, and this is a country which is really has been affected by migration flows and refugees in a way that we can hardly fathom uh, from a European perspective. So Lebanon, having between six and seven million people, has absorbed some 1.5 million refugees. And if we are talking about this in a European perspective, that would be equivalent of uh, the EU countries re uh, receiving 125 million refugees. Uh, so we see some uh, of the challenges. Uh, so uh, Nada uh, is a medical doctor. She is head of epidemiological surveillance program at the Lebanese Ministry of Public Health. And I'm very interested to hear your views how to deal with such a situation really in the midst of a crisis that we don't really see in Europe. Please, Nada. So, good afternoon. Uh, first, I would like to thank EFA and the CDC to uh, invite me to attend to this conference and also to this plenary session. So, uh, if we want to think about planet Earth and building bridge in the context of current migrations, we have to work together. And I will share with you my thought from my Lebanese experience. So, let's 
look first to our situation in Lebanon. So Lebanon is a country where we estimate that the population excluding Syrian is about 4,800,000. And for this population, we have a, for a health system where we have around 27 hospital beds per 10,000 inhabitants, 31 clinicians per 10,000 inhabitants, and we have a health sectors mainly private sector, and we have medical centers more than 900. The life expectancy is around 81 years at birth. In addition to this, we have the Syrian crisis since 2011. So we have a high influx of Syrians coming from Syria to Lebanon. As for the UN data of October 2019, we have 918,000 registered Syrians in Lebanon. But this number is underestimating the reality because the registration of new arrivals has been suspended since May 2015, so many years ago. And when we look to the deliveries of babies last year, among the 126,000 deliveries, 40 to 45% were Syrian babies. Syrians in Lebanon, they live in all provinces, in our eight provinces, 80%, 80 80% lives in the community, and 20% in informal settlements, where we have a high risk of increased infectious diseases for this population. Now, I'm working as a Ministry of Public Health, Let's go back to our mission. Our mission, we have a double mission. The first one, national mission, is to is ensure the essential public health functions and services for our population. And when we talk about population, all population, whatever is the nationality. If I want to protect Lebanese, I have also to protect the non-Lebanese. So for me, the population is whatever was the nationality. And on the other hand, I have my second dimension, international dimension, where we have to contribute to global health security, and this is based on the international health regulations with the 20, 2005 revision. So, how can we do it? So, here, having bridges between countries, cross-border bridges, can build, can enhance our capacity on how to deal with a new situation. So here I will take an example of cross-border cooperation between countries and regions, how we can develop our workforce to better deal with a new situation, and this will be with the MediPiet. MediPiet is a Mediterranean program for intervention epidemiology training. It started in 2012, and the new phase, phase two, is extended up to 2021. MediPiet, where we have here two, uh, two um, major activities. It's a two-year training program, or training for people, for nationals, and also to have professional networking between professionals across borders. For Lebanon, since 2014, we have five people who have been trained with MediPiet, four from the Ministry of Public Health, and one enrolled currently from the Ministry of Agriculture. So what are the results of this MediPiet facing the migration and the Syrian influx. I will give you six examples from the MediPet projects that have been uh, prepared and worked by the fellows during their, their uh, on-job training. The first example is 2014 mom's outbreak. It was a huge outbreak affecting Lebanese, Syrian, and Lebanese. Uh, investigation was conducted vaccine efficacy was computed, and as a result, when we have good information, we can also have, uh, we can guide the results, is to enhance routine vaccination for Lebanese and Syrian, and to introduce for Palestinian the second dose of MMR. So this is what an action based on a case investigation and case control studies. Another example is about 2016 outbreak of influenza AH5N1 in poultry farms. So we get this H5N1 in, in two poultry farms in Nabishit in the Bekaa. The, the tragedy, so the virus came through Syria. And here we have activated our national plan for uh, influenza, novel influenza, where we have the Ministry of Agriculture to define the contention zone and to do the calling. And from the public health sector, we have to identify all exposed persons in this contention uh, zone to provide antiviral prophylaxis and to do the follow-up to search for any cases among humans and also uh, to uh, enhance uh, surveillance of 
human cases. The outbreak was uh, declared in April 2016, and it was declared contained in June 2016 with no human cases. Another example, it will be polio. Polio outbreak has emerged in our region in 2013 and 14. We had cases in Syria and in Iraq with wild polio virus type 1. And also again, in 2017, we have the vaccine derived polio virus type 2 in Syria again. Lebanon was mentioned as at high risk of polio importation. So here, again, we have to do repetitive campaigns against polio, but also to enhance our surveillance system. And so, through Medipiat, we have initiated environmental polio surveillance, where we take samples from sewage plant looking for polio virus, and up to now, no wild, neither vaccine direct polio virus was detected. Another example is to start community-based surveillance system, and we have seen in the talk previously that we need to involve the communities and migrant in our system. So here also we have used, we are training outreach volunteers to detect tremors among Syrians and to, to report them to the ministry so we can verify and investigate the cases. So this is our examples of Medipiad. And if we go back to the planet Earth, so we all live in this planet Earth. And if you want to think globally, we have to do good action locally. So we have to have a continuous surveillance system. We have to have a continuous cross-border coordination and exchange of information. We have to do it at all level, country level, regional level, but also at international level, global level. For the questions of these sessions, shall I reply now or later? <laughs> Maybe we could, uh, like, well, take it now. <laughs> so, there were some questions for the cross-border um, cooperation. What is this important? It's very important to strengthen uh, the exchange of knowledge and of expertise between countries. So, to build the capacity of the countries to have a better understanding of uh, disease dynamics and to guide these activities and response, and also. Despite the huge burden of the migration, it's still an opportunity to revise and to enhance our essential public health functions to have better global health security. Thank you. Nada, thank you very much for um, bringing to life the, the, the magnitudes of, of the challenge that um, dealing with such huge populations can, can represent. I think it, it, you know, it's nice to see global figures, but actually having a the country example is really brings it to life and it's very sobering and of course you I think you illustrated and Sally also mentioned that you can't consider health and public health of migrants and of, of the rest of the population separately they're they're very intertwined there are interdependencies and of course to, to tackle this in a holistic way you need to understand who these migrants are and what their health needs are and in order to do this you need you need data and you need information um, and I'd like to introduce our next, um, our next speaker, Dr. Neha Patak, who will um, tackle the, the, the risk and the benefits. Um, Neha is a, a, a doctor specializing in sexual health, um, working uh, as a clinician uh, in, a, in a large hospital in London, in Guys and St. Thomas, for those of you who know London, uh, but is also a research, fellows, a research fellow, sorry. Um, and she's um, managing a program of over a million uh, electronic healthcare records of migrants to understand how, um, how, the, how this group um, accesses healthcare. So, Niha, would you like to um, share with the audience the, the sort of the risk and the benefits of such large data sets focused on migrants? Uh, thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. It's such an honor to be here and talk about my work and the importance of electronic health records in the context of migration health research. As Michael said, I'm a sexual health doctor by background, so I'm going to start with one of my favorite quotes about big data related to sex. Big data is like teenage sex. Everyone talks about it. Nobody really knows how to do it and everyone thinks everyone else is doing it, so they say they're doing it too. <laughs> that quote was from 2013, and now in 2019, I like to think of 
big data as a bit more like sex in our 20s. We actually are doing it now. Some of us are doing it a lot, some not so much. And we're starting to understand how to do it well. But really importantly, that has to be done with always thinking about using protection. And data protection is key to everything. Um, so what does big data mean for migration health? So our research unit is the Center for Public Health Data Science. And it's about the intersect between using principles of public health, epidemiology, and computer science so that we can use electronic health records on a really large scale to help underserved populations more and more. As Michael kindly pointed out, we have a couple of programs of work with more than a million electronic health records of migrants to the UK. Um, and there are clear, health bene uh, clear benefits of creating such large cohorts. We have a huge amount of power epidemiologically in these cohorts, which is important in any health study anyway. But in the context of migration health, where there is so much negative rhetoric, there is such a power in data of that scale to advocate, to dispel myths about migrants. And in the UK in particular, where public perceptions are often guided by how migrants are represented in the media, having large-scale data is a really powerful advocacy tool to fight blatant lies, really, that are said in the press. It's also a really efficient use of data. It doesn't cost very much, it's recorded anyway, and you really are only funding the researcher. I'm a PhD student right now, I'm not very expensive. Um, however, there are real risks to be aware of, and I hope I can give a bit of insight into overcoming those risks too. Because of how data is presented in the media, it can be used to fuel negative rhetoric. It can be used to justify policies that discriminate against migrants. And at its most extreme, and we've seen this in the UK, there can be requests by the government or the Home Office in the UK to get access to identifiable data in a way that can then be used against people. We have a duty as academics and public health practitioners to use data accurately in a rigorous scientific manner and in an ethical fashion so that it is not used to discriminate against migrants. And I think the theme of building bridges is a really good way to talk about using big data. We collaborate with migrant groups and uh, organizations that support migrants so that they have a role in designing the research questions that we are using big data for. So the primary driver behind it is not political, it is not a government, it is migrants themselves and the needs that they want addressed. We also collaborate with people that are far better at using artificial intelligence and, sci and um, data science than us as clinicians or public health practitioners so that we can be relying on those results with m greater validity. There is a growing move in data science to publish code that is used to create cohorts and to complete the analyses. So we are being transparent and that increases the accuracy of any interpretations that we make from that data and opens up a dialogue so that people can uh, suggest better ways of using that data. And that makes us more honest about the limitations. So for example, in the data sets that we use, one is linked care from primary care data. We know that's really good for chronic disease, so we can help address some of the issues around non-communicable diseases, but it's not so good for infections. And if we can be honest and transparent about which data sets are used for which type of research question, then we can make better use of that. So in summary, I think we should share good practice on using data. We should be grounded in data protection principles throughout and be careful about where we are sharing our data so that we can reduce the potential for harm and increase the potential for health improvement.
Thank you very much, Nia. Uh, I think you raised a number of very, very important questions, uh, including the ethical aspects. And I think this is something that we are probably not discussing enough. Uh, so I was very happy uh, with, with that intervention. Uh, you are coming, we have now heard uh, country perspectives. Uh, you are very much close to the migrant communities in, in your countries with the research, etc. Nada was uh, presenting uh, also from a different kind of country perspective. Uh, but if we are bringing this uh, now also up to uh, the European level, what can Europe do in this situation? And uh, especially for us working in an EU setting, is there a role for interventions, activities from the European Union? Uh, and we have a person here who is very well suited to give some reflections of that. So I'm happy to present our last panelist, uh, who is Isabel de la Mata, uh, Principal Advisor for Health and Crisis Management at Didi Santé at the European Commission. And I know that you also have some reflections of this. So please, uh, Isabel, the floor is yours. Thank you, Carl. So I'm going to, to bring a different perspective about the building bridges. So when we talk about migration, migration and health, uh, we usually talk about the, uh, I mean, the usual suspect and uh, like-minded people. So in that way, we are not going to advance because we all agree uh, what we should do and uh, what we are doing wrong. So our uh, bridges that we are trying to, to build and, and to, uh, I mean, uh, even to, to eliminate because we will be all in the same uh, side of the river is uh, to work with the other professionals, other people. So, uh, and especially with the people that are taking care of migration and the, and the police and the enforcement uh, people and the interior ministers and uh, things like that. Uh, that the, at the European Union, uh, you know that there are uh, competences that are of different level. In health, we always complain that we don't have competence, but on migration, we, we have a lot of competences. So we have been trying to put uh, those uh, walls and those issues together. And we have been trying, uh, sometimes with success, sometimes with less, less success. And uh, the review of all the legislation on migration, uh, we have advanced a, a little bit, not much, but a little bit, trying to integrate a health article in all the migration legislation, in all the conditions. I mean, for uh, legal migration was already something quite old. For the asylum seekers, uh, we were trying to improve. For the reception centers, we were trying to improve. Uh, and, and for all the activities. The only thing that we haven't succeeded, because there is no legislation at, at all, is the irregular, undocumented, so the other migrants. But uh, we decided to move in the, in the last two years, one step ahead. That was, uh, we know that the, the care, the health care of the, of the migrants needs some specific competencies by the health professionals because not all our health professionals are trained to deal with different populations. Not only from the point of view of uh, cultural competencies, etc., uh, but also from the knowing of the diseases that could be different, but also the relation with the, with the disease that different populations can have. And, and, and everybody has been doing this kind of training. So, uh, and what about the other? Uh, professionals that are working with, uh, with migrants. So we decided, uh, and we have been doing, and I think that has been successful, uh, to make the training of uh, other workforce force that are working with the uh, migrants. Uh, so the law enforcement officials. Because social workers, they are in the, in the borderline. They usually work in the, in the health uh, care facilities. So yes, training then was not, uh, uh, I mean, a challenge. But training the law enforcement officials, uh, the first surprise that, uh, was that um, uh, all the training were uh, not only well received, but much more well received than uh, by the healthcare professionals. And that uh, they even requested more. And we had the situation in one of the, of the entry countries that uh, we were not able to cope with all of that because they were requesting even the professional association of law enforcement officials that was not possible to train uh, everybody. 
we went uh, into the ministries uh, of interior and the, and the response was uh, really positive and, and they needed that and the, the people that are in the reception center. And uh, I have to specify that the, the training was a general one, but with more uh, specific on mental and communicable diseases. Uh, I mean, very basic, but trying to identify when a person needs a, a specific care, uh, when needs to, to be derived, uh, what happens if in the middle of the night something has uh, that, what uh, are the main issues that you need to, to pay attention uh, on the reception, uh, uh, when uh, already one month or something has uh, passed away. Uh, so things quite easy, but that uh, could help them to identify how to uh, better train, uh, better uh, uh, care those people. The migrants, and, and not only that, uh, some of the of the training that we did, we did uh, joint training for the health professionals and also the uh, the law enforcement official, and that was even um, better accepted because uh, all different professionals working together, but with a common purpose. I mean, they found that was uh, attractive and that we needed uh, to to continue on that. As uh, you know, that uh, the, uh, the health program is working with the uh, annual work plans and that the, the money is scarce and we have uh, many competing priorities. Now we have moved another step back and we, are, uh, we have uh, passed these trainings to the ECDC and they are going to host and they are going to continue doing that. But uh, I mean, my main or our main uh, take uh, from, uh, from this uh, intervention is that uh, uh, we need to think uh, outside, I am not going to say uh, out of the box, but outside of our zone of comfort and outside of our usual stakeholders and usual uh, suspects because uh, we are convinced that we will not advance if we don't include uh, the, the other side of the table. Uh, and the other side of the table usually are the, the migrants community. We have already done that. Uh, this is not a challenge. Uh, but uh, the other per person, the other people in the government that can have a different view, usually more economic, usually more legalistic, but that are important because we will not advance. But also the, the, the people that are low in the, in the scale, the real staff, the real civil servants, as uh, we, the doctors, usually are, and that they have uh, something to do with migrants and that they, uh, they are key to advance and to have uh, a better health for all the population that uh, is uh, living in the European Union, whatever the origin, ethnicity and country of origin. Thank you very much. I think we've had some very different um, perspectives and I think it's, it's, it sort of gives us a, a lot of material for, for, for discussion. So, Carl, if that's okay, I'll, I'll kick off the, the discussion. May, maybe we should uh, explain also the panel here because yes. you may note that there is one important actor missing here. Uh, and that's actually representative for the migrant community itself. Uh, so we are sorry that uh, one of the panelists uh, were unable to come. Uh, so we had uh, Abal Moindatste from uh, France, uh, who was unable to come here. And uh, we are really sorry that we were not able to also present this from the perspective of the migrants. Because I think quite often uh, we fall in the trap of talking about people rather than talking with people. Uh, but uh, for the panel discussion here, uh, we would like to talk with each other. <laughs> so uh, do you want to spark it or should I spark it? Um, I, I have a question for, for Nader actually, if, if you don't mind. Um, you gave some of the figures, I think you said about four million people in, in, in Lebanon, and then overnight you had, sorry, six, five or six million, and then an extra million refugees, is that right? More or less? Mm -hmm. So, um, <coughs> estimated population, excluding Syrian, is about four million eight hundred thousand. Okay. And then for the Syrian, official numbers is 900,000 okay. registered. So we don't include here the non-registered ones. Okay. Because since 2015, 
the new arrivals who are still arriving are not registered. But you can imagine the dimension when you look to the deliveries. Yeah, so that's it, more or less a 20% addition to your population in a very short amount of time. And th the immediate thought that springs to mind is the, 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 the impact on, on the capacity of the healthcare system. You know, suddenly you need 20% additional doses of vaccine, 20% extra appointments in hospitals, in primary care. So what lessons did you learn as a country in the last few years on, on, on coping with such a, a, a large magnitude of, um, of people on, 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 the, on the healthcare system and how did you cope? In order to co-op with this new situation, you have to scale up your, your resources. So for the healthcare facilities, we have enough resources. If you look to our indicators, we are having as uh, middle or high middle income countries. But what was missing is to have additional funds to cover these extra fees. And here came the role of the UN agencies. So we have the UNICEF, WHO, UNCHR, who are covering the extra fees for the CL population. So they provide uh, donations for the vaccines, but also for the admissions to hospitals. As for the military case, so they are using the same system as Lebanese. So we have the 900 medical centers across the country, and these centers are open to all nationalities. Thank you, Nada. Uh, I mean, this whole uh, conference is about building bridges and um, you have brought, all panelists have brought certain perspectives in and I think that we could talk a lot about various bridges. Uh, but I would like to ask you, Neha, uh, because you are bringing in here uh, the perspective of an academic uh, and I was a little bit curious how you see the bridge between academia and, and us working within uh, the public health sector. Are we listening enough to you? Uh, are there ways to communicate better or are we really working in parallel silos? Well, my experience so far has definitely been that we are working together. And it's really hard to say if that is everywhere, but for us, we're very careful to make sure that we are transdisciplinary. So we have lots of members of our academic team who also work as frontline clinical providers or have been anthropologists or have frontline public health and humanitarian experience. And that adds such an important dimension in terms of our networks because we each bring with us such a diverse group of contacts and rather than saying we so for example rather than me saying i'm a sexual health doctor so i only know about sexual health and i will only do anything about sexual health we learn and build these bridges with each other so we learn together with policymakers for sexual health and come find those questions together rather than being didactic with it. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, Isabel. <laughs> Yes, uh, we have experience, very good experience and very bad experience of working with academia. But I think that is fundamental because uh, they are the ones that uh, can explore all the options, that have the time to explore all the options and to present a uh, 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 different range of, uh, of them. Usually we are uh, very busy with the day to day. Uh, and we don't have this, this opportunity. And at the same time, uh, what we can provide uh, to the academy is a touch of reality. Because sometimes uh, in paper, everything uh, is good, but uh, it's not ap applicable. So I think that we need to, to work together and, uh, and that we need to improve this, this relation and not to consider that they are separate and, and completely different and that they, the academy is going on one side, the administration is going on, on another side, but uh, to try to improve this, this relation and, uh, and even to have more frequent exchanges. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sally. Um, as well, I think migrant health is, over, overall has suffered from quite a chronic lack of funding over the years. Mm -hmm. And as academics, um, often it's an aside for academics working in other areas. They take on migrant health. Um, often you see studies published and then they disappear into the ether and nothing else happens with them. And I think we've got to get better now at sort of 
um, better funding streams um, and a more sort of coherent response to research. Okay, thank you. Another potential bridge is the bridge between individuals themselves and, and, and the bridges between migrant populations and other populations in Europe. And, and w one of the issues that, one of the risks is, is the risk of stigmatizing these populations. Um, and, and actually these bridges are not always open and I think you mentioned the, the British press and I mean sometimes you have, um, you know, particularly in the context of increasing um, populist movements in Europe, how do we ensure from, you know, in the ground through research and evidence generation, through policy, that um, we avoid stigma as much as possible and we mitigate it? I mean, for us, it comes back to collaborating with migrants and migrant groups. So we present the data first there. We design the questions with migrants and answer priorities to them rather than priorities to groups that might be stigmatizing them. It is really, really difficult to uh, advocate for health needs of a group that might be being seen and put in such a negative light but often data shows that so in the UK a big thing is health tourism are people coming to the NHS just to use the health service um, and you'll see in the media written about uh, women coming just to have their children in the NHS but good data demonstrates that it's just not true and if we work in collaboration with advocacy groups rather than just academics telling other academics, then we get that information out better to dispel those myths. But it's like you said, we can't work on our own. We have to be in collaboration. And with the media, because uh, I mean, the, the harm and the good that the media can do uh, and, uh, and not only the social media, but the traditional, traditional one. But there is a, a something that I think that we need to reflect uh, also, and that is the, the political situation. Uh, we, we are seeing the European Union uh, in the, uh, all the recent elections, and sorry, uh, we have the, the one in my own country uh, just uh, two weeks ago, and uh, we, are going, uh, we are seeing a movement uh, that uh, different uh, political parties are emerging, and uh, some of the explanation of the, this emergency of uh, these new uh, political parties have a lot to do with, uh, with migration. I mean, with the wrong perception of the, of the migration and with the, uh, I don't know how to say, but uh, furious uh, uh, reaction of uh, uh, some part of the population through what they, they consider that are uh, unrightful, uh, uh, benefits from the, from the migrants or, or that the, the bad health situation that the migrants are imposing on that. And I think that we need to react to do and to react with the real data, as you say, but also to communicate uh, those data. And this is uh, something that we, we all need to do uh, together. I think uh, as researchers and, and healthcare, healthcare workers, we've got to redouble our efforts on sort of tackling the xenophobia and, and really, as I said in my presentation, pushing forward some of these more positive aspects of migration, that migration can be healthy and how do we make it healthy for everybody? And, you know, I think when it comes to migrant health, we really are talking about sort of modest investments in preventative healthcare and primary care and you know these these individuals contribute hugely to the European economy um, and to their countries back home as I mentioned in my talk and I really do think we've got to redouble our efforts to push out these positive messages wherever possible. Thank you. Talking about bridges again uh, there are of course also other bridges and that's bridges between various organizations now, it happens to be that in this specific plenary, we are two representatives from the European Union, myself and, and, and Isabel. Uh, but we should, of course, not forget that there are other very important actors here, uh, not least the WHO uh, and, and, and the WHO Global Action Plan to promote the health of refugees and, and, and migrants. Uh, we 
had unfortunately also a clash within between different planners here. Uh, but uh, I think that the work of WHO uh, is going to be well presented in this organization uh, in, in this conference. Uh, so uh, I'm also urging everyone that is interested in that to also look in the conference program and, and go to other sessions related to migrant health. I don't know if any of you would like to uh, comment on this. Yes, Nada. So we have to work with them and to see what are their needs when we talk about migrants. So when they came to Lebanon first, the first immediate needs were to have shelter, food and security. And then after that, you need to ensure the needed health system for them, health care, preventive and curative services. But after that, you have to look long away what they need is after that. So you need also education, because most, the majority of the migrants in Lebanon are young people, and here you have to ensure that they are going to schools. So also here we have to have cross uh, sectorial collaboration, so education is also available for these children. In Lebanon, for CN children, so they have three options, either to go to Lebanese schools, public or private, or the scale-up system done the Ministry of Education to open afternoon shift of public schools for the Syrian population in case they didn't have places in the morning sex sessions and also for the ones who have difficulties on around 38 NGOs are doing non-formal education. So when we talk about migration, we have security, shelters, food, but also we have two big things to ensure for them, health and education. Um, I was. I think we're we're sort of getting towards the end of the of the session, and I think um, Carl was going to to give a few closing remarks. But before that, you have one of the biggest public health gatherings uh, in Europe today, and many people in the audience will have some kind of involvement with migrant population, either through surveillance, through public health practice, through clinical practice, and this is an opportunity for you to give a a one-sentence address, a one-sentence advice to everyone in the audience to take home, for them to change their, their practice when they go back to their home countries. <laughs> it's a difficult one. Mine is simple, really. Um, you can't do good research without co-production with migrants. And that is at all stages of the data life cycle, whether that is deciding what data you're going to collect, what data you're going to analyze, and what results you're going to disseminate. They, you know, will never know that as well, so we have to work together. Mine was very similar to say that we can't design and deliver services to migrants without engaging migrants. Unbelievably, we haven't done much of that in recent years um, and there's definitely a move towards co-design of services um, and I think it's absolutely critical if we're going to make this kind of thing work in Europe. Yeah, I'm going to, to say something different. I mean, both of you are British uh, and uh, we know that in, in data and health information is the, the British against the, the rest of the European Union usually. And uh, so if we really <laughs> want uh, to be able to analyze uh, uh, all the to have all the data and to have uh, all the, the data regarding the migration status the ethnicity and, and others then we need to change the legislation the European legislation and the data protection legislation and we need uh, also when we are going to do that if we are going to do that we need to take into account why in origin we had this kind of prohibition of collecting or analyzing this kind of data. I mean, going to the World War II, the Balkans, etc., etc., etc. So be careful, but that doesn't mean that we don't need to do that. We need to do that, but with time and carefully. So we have to work with them. So, um, this is a solution because you can put plans, but not fitting their needs. When you go to the informal settlements, health is not a priority. So we have to think with them what is the best solution for them to get services. So uh, thank you very much, everyone.
So if I could just conclude with a few words. Uh, I think this plenary really uh, linked to the themes of the conference, building bridges. So we have today talked about several bridges. We have uh, talked about the bridging from misconceptions to getting a, a more truthful understanding what are the real issues. Uh, and especially since we are living in a situation where fake news uh, are, are all around us. So I think this is important for us public health professionals to try really to uh, work on that bridge. We have also uh, been discussing the bridge between Europe and the rest of the world. Uh, we are living in a truly global village and uh, borders are porous and uh, if there are issues, borders are very seldom the solution to a problem. We have discussed other bridges. We have been talking about the bridge between academic research and bringing in the ethical perspective, uh, which is so important when we are talking about uh, vulnerable groups. Uh, we have been talking about the bridge between academia and, and the public health, but there's been one bridge that we have been circulating a little bit around and, 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 and not, not really addressed, and one which is very close to my heart, and that is within this larger public health community also to build bridges between communicable diseases and non-communicable diseases. Uh, I'm representing ECDC and we have a clear mandate which is restricted to communicable diseases which makes it extra pleasurable, interesting to come to a conference like this one where it's really exposure to the broad public health uh, and also to address issues related to migration uh, we should not only look at our own uh, tunnels and our own areas of work, but also reaching out to public health professionals and professionals outside the public health sphere and trying to build truly interdisciplinary bridges. Uh, and I also would like to thank the audience, uh, so many of you, uh, sitting here at 10 to 6 uh, in the evening uh, and I think this is also a sign that the topic that we have been discussed here is a very important one. Uh, so thanks to the panel, thanks to the keynote speaker and thanks to the audience and wishing everyone a nice evening and I think uh, many of us will uh, reconvene at the welcome reception later tonight. Thank you very much.